Good morning good and morning. happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy so, Sabbath. Happy Sabbath and good morning. Yes. Today we're going to talk about <clears throat> meekness in the crucible. Mm. And meekness in the crucible <clears throat> probably is one of the more challenging um, topics that we'll have here going through this crucible issue. But before we start, David, would you pray for us? Absolutely. Our loving Father, Lord Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit, we just thank you for a week that has been eventful, and there's a lot of things happening in this world. But we know that our trust, our rock, and our refuge is on you. You are the one who delivers us. Lord, we praise you for your meekness, that love, the pure love and the grace and the way you speak to us, and the way you showed your love on the cross. We cannot thank you enough for that, but we want you to bring the Holy Spirit on us as Danielle, Barbara, and myself talk about the words that are in the Sabbath school lesson and in the scripture. We pray for the people that are coming to Sabbath school and who will be watching this, that let everyone understand and apply the wisdom from above. Lord, we need you in every step of the way. Forgive our sins and listen to our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> so our, our uh, scripture today is Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. <coughs> I like what the, um, <coughs> our, our lesson has to say about meekness. Because we don't really see or hear meekness used a lot in the Bible. Um, we see it a little bit with Moses in the Beatitudes. But <clears throat> otherwise, it's, it's not that, that um, used that often. When they, the, the lesson defines meekness, too, as enduring injury with patience and without resentment. So that's probably why we don't hear so much about it, because it's a trait that, number one, isn't that acceptable in cultures. And secondly, <clears throat> we'd like to grumble. <laughs> and so it's, it's hard to, to really be meek. Um, sometimes it transla is translated a little bit into humility. So the lesson looks at um, meekness and humility together. But meekness enduring injury with, with patience and without resentment is one of the most powerful characteristics of Jesus and his followers. Yet, it's not an end of itself. Meekness of spirit can be a powerful weapon in the hands of those who are in the midst of pain and suffering. Indeed, the crucible is a great place to learn meekness of heart. And <clears throat> I, it, it might be a great place, but it's also a difficult place. So let's look at a little, a little bit about meekness throughout the Bible. <clears throat> we see it both in the Old and New Testament. And as we said, Moses was humble. Uh, that taught, we, we'll see that in Numbers 12, 3. And we'll hear about, we'll, we'll read that a little bit later in our lesson. But right now, I just want us to think about Moses and his meekness. Because I didn't always see Moses as meek. After all, he did kill someone out of anger. Um, and so I think maybe those 40 years he was in the tending sheep helped him learn meekness, which gives me a little bit of hope because it does mean that meekness can be learned. Yes. Um, David declared that the meek shall inherit the earth. We see that in Psalms 37:11. The prophets announced that God will bless the meek. Um, <clears throat> we see that from the prophets. Isaiah said... The humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. He also says in verse uh, 66 too, For all those things my hand has made, and all things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, who trembles at my word. And that trembles at my word means that they really, really believe and, and take it to heart. Um, we also see in Zephaniah 3:11 and 12, 
In that day you shall not be ashamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. For then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride. So pride is not a good thing and shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave your midst a meek and humble people and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. So in God's holy heaven, there won't be the proudful. Only the meek will be in, uh, on, on the holy mountain. And then if we look at um, how God himself is described as meek, we see that in Psalms 25, 9. The humble he guides in justice, the humble he teaches in his way. And 147, 6, the Lord lifts the humble up the humble, he casts the wicked down to the ground. So it, we're, we're seeing a pattern here, aren't we, as, in, in this lesson about the difference between prideful and humility. You know, Jesus himself was meek. And we see um, in Acts, it says, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and was a lamb before its shearers, silent, and he opened not his mouth. So Christ, even though he was being attacked, he was being criticized, um, they told, you know, they said, they said, you know, if you're God, come off the cross. When he was going through Pilate, um, when he was going through K with Caiaphas, all of the things that he went through, he stayed very meek and very humble through that. And we see that God looks at meekness as one of the foundations of Christianity. He says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And we'll probably hear that several times through our lesson today. Um, the apostles were meek. We know that. Uh, Paul, myself, I'm pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Now, Paul himself, it took him a bit to become meek. Paul wasn't someone that I would, I would really look at as meek. And they, 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 encur they encouraged us as Christians to be meek as well, with gentleness, self-control, and we'll be looking at the, all those gifts and fruits of the Spirit. Uh, Colossians 3.12 says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long suffering. And we see this over and over again in the Bible, in Titus and James, and first Peter and uh, first Peter 315 says but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear so whenever we <clears throat> we we encounter people and we're teaching his word we need to do it with meekness and fear because arrogance and pride you may win your you may, may, may win the, 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 the battle. Yeah, you may win the argument, but you won't win their hearts. And so we really need to consider this issue of, of meekness and fear. I want to read to you in uh, here from Heavenly Places by Ellen White. She says, meekness is a precious Christian attribute. The meekness and loneliness of Christ are only learned by wearing Christ's yoke. That yoke signifies entire submission. The heavenly universe looks upon an absence of meekness and lowliness of heart. The self-exaltation, the feeling of swelling importance, makes the human agent so large in his own estimation that he feels that he has no need for a savior, no need to wear Christ's yoke. But the invitation to each soul is, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek, lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. The submission of Christ demands is brought about by the work of the Holy Spirit. There must be a transformation for the entire being, heart, soul, and character. Only at the altar of sacrifice and from the hand of God can the selfish grasping man receive the celestial torch which receives his own incompetence and leads him to submit to the Savior's yoke, to learn his meekness and lowliness. So this, this whole concept of lowliness is, I, I'm glad we're looking at this lesson because it's, it's a key for um, our Christian lives. 
So Danielle, talk to us more about the, the broken bread. Broken bread and poured out wine is the title of Sunday's <clears throat> lesson. And uh, I was looking, first of all, at that title, because it's a very interesting title. And uh, the reason for it was the, le the writer of the lessons trying to portray to us the fact that bread must be broken to be consumed. And grapes must be crushed to become juice. And so Jesus had to. I mean, we, he is the symbols of his sacrifice for us is broken bread, like we do at communion. And grape juice or uh, wine so that it signifies his sacrifice for us and in that he's our example to us but let's break this down a little further because that's a catchy title but we really have to dig a little deeper so i was looking first at meekness and what exactly does it mean because it's a word that we hear a lot but we don't use nowadays it's not like we're going to say she's meek we say he's humble or she's humble, but it has a slightly different meaning. Humble is different than meek. It's an adjective, and it means humbly patient or quiet in nature as under provocation from others, like you're quiet in nature while you're being provoked by others. Overly submissive or compliant was also one of the descriptions. Tame, gentle, kind, forbearing, uncomplaining, passive, unassuming, Pacific or pacific, mm, calm, obedient, weak, timid, soft, yielding. As I contemplate this descriptive list, it is kind of obvious that these are not attributes that are praised and glorified in this day and age, where, in this society that we live in. As a matter of fact, they can be considered derogatory connotations if we describe someone as tame, unassuming, passive, timid, soft, yielding. And yet, Jesus in the Beatitudes, we know this text, and it's our memory text for this uh, study this week. In Matthew 5, he said, 5, 5, Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, from our society's perspective, that sounds like nonsense. When we imagine someone conquering, inheriting the earth, we really do not see, um, we have visions of conquering generals and armies, and farthest from our thought is someone that would be obedient and tame uh, or those that are meek. But how prevalent is the word meek in the Bible? Uh, when I searched the word meek, it came up 29 times specifically, but the <clears throat> subject in itself appears much more than that. Just the word meek in itself appears already 29 times. And I like to and the first time that it appears, the very first time, is describing Moses. So the first time the word meek is used in the Bible is in Numbers 12.3. And it says, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Wow. And I was thinking, just like Barbara was saying, it's like I never thought of Moses kind of meek. I kind of saw him like this general figure leading the Israelites. But really he was. And we'll probably hear from the other people, the, the, uh, some, some of, uh, throughout our lesson today. So I won't explore a lot of that because I have too much to explore already. So in the Bible, what does the Bible say about the meek and their future perspectives besides what we read in the Beatitudes? In Psalm 25, 9, it says, the humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his ways. The Lord guides in justice, and he personally teaches those that are humble and meek. He does not do so with the arrogant and self-assured. Isaiah 61, 1, this is the prophet Isaiah speaking, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. So Isaiah is saying that he has been anointed by the Lord. Why? To preach good tidings to the poor. And this is also one of the prophecies about Jesus as well. So it's sort of talking about his job, but also the Lord's job. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And then in Zephaniah 2, 3, it says, Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility, 
it may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's danger. We kind of see over and over and over of, again as we review every text related to those that are meek, it becomes clear that the Lord has a special connection to the meek. Uh, I won't review more texts, but that's the overwhelming theme. And why? Because they are like him. He is meek. We see in Matthew 11, 29, in Jesus' own words, talking about himself, Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And again, in Jesus' own words, description, self-described, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey. Lowly is the word meek in Greek, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So he's describing, and as we saw in the opening part of the lesson, Moses is first described as the most meek on the earth at the time he lived, but basically the most meek that we've ever studied or known is Jesus. The Lord Jesus suffered on our behi beha behalf compliantly to bring about the salvation and secure our place next to him in heaven. And how meek he was. I mean, he left the glory of heaven, uh, total and complete glory, that's unimaginable glory, to come to this earth, to identify with the poor, to go through a crucible in order to save us, and to do it in a mild and meek lamb, described as a lamb going to a slaughter, and to be our example of complete faith and total dependence on God the Father. Now, we also know Abraham was similar. He trusted on the Lord and complied when Isaac was to be sacrificed until the lamb was provided. And the pattern is very clear. In of ourselves, meekness is not something we can pull out of ourselves with our own power. It blossoms through total and complete surrender and dependence on God while we are passing through a crucible. And God is the one that plants it in our hearts through the Word and the Holy Spirit, and God is the one that nurtures it and grows it in us. Without us even realizing, it takes root in us and becomes an evident, beautiful, blossoming flower that those around us can clearly and evidently see, a flower that, can, that they just can't take their eyes off of. It draws them to us, and ultimately they see the light in us Jesus. It's a flower that those around us can clearly and evidently see as we pass through the crucible, hand in hand with the Lord. And the only reason it, it, it can take place is when we are allowing the Lord to take the reins and when we have total and complete faith in the fact that he is still providing and leading. Now, what does this flower look like? If we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 to 12, it says, so let's imagine that. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessel that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. And that's the key. The excellence of the power is of God, not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not despaired. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Only God in us. Thank you. David, I'm looking forward to this one. Interceding for grace. Yeah, you know, um, it says we are saved by grace through Jesus Christ. Now, as I was studying uh, Daniel and Barbara, you know, such good introduction, I don't, I just was looking at this one word on meekness. It says resentment without resentment. And I was talking to Daniel about that earlier. See, we are dust. If you look at this PowerPoint, you'll see the next slide. 
that a gardener, you know, when they touch the ground, there's some meekness to it. And we're just dust. So God is telling us we've got to be meek inherently because only through Jesus Christ we can get out of this dust nature and become in the image and likeness of Jesus again, right? So, so meekness, you know, the grace, um, uh, interceding for grace is a characteristic of meekness. And grace here is only possible in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he does not harbor any ill will. It is not. Jesus' grace towards us is not based on how we treat him. It is his choice and choice alone. So no matter how hard we as human beings try to be graceful or show grace for somebody, I know that even if somebody says forgiveness, to, uh, tells me that please forgive me, it will be hard for me to hold no resentment. It is impossible, and that is why Jesus Christ is the only meekest person and the only one who can give grace. Now, I'm glad you guys brought up the Moses story because when Moses was in Egypt, you remember he held resentment towards the Egyptians, and so he killed somebody. So he wasn't meek. However, through the desert and also when he came back from the mountain, you know, uh, uh, Sabbath school lesson mentions Exodus 32, 14. And here, when Moses was coming down, the Israelites started to worship um, a calf, golden calf again. And uh, the Lord was angry. He was very angry. And the question was, what to do here? And we see that um, Moses, he spent 40 days with God just before this. So as you can tell, meekness or grace will not come unless we spend time with God. It is the key here, the relationship aspect. And Moses interceded for, uh, the question is, why did God listen to Moses? Because he interceded for the people of Israel without resentment. So God listened to Moses and gave them grace. You see the word, um, Hebrew word for um, uh, meek is anau. Anau, which means somebody is willing to bear a heavy burden. It's not given to us. We have no other way, but this is the only way. It's a voluntary thing. And that is why Moses, you know, he has taken that uh, role of being a meek person. You see, he had problems with his sister Miriam, Aaron. He had problems with everybody, but he continued to help them no matter what. Whenever they complained, he cried out to the Lord. So Moses' weakness wasn't a character of timidity, or letting other people run over him. On the contrast, it's a powerful demonstration of disciplined strength beyond what most people could endure. This is what the meekness of Moses is about. This is the grace that uh, God is looking for through meekness, and Jesus showed it to us. You see, we in life will see people that we don't like, or people don't like us, and we will see them going through crucibles. And at that time, if we are truly meek, if we have connection with Jesus, and if we want to be filled with the true grace, what we have to do is not the delight in people's struggles, especially to people that we don't like or they hurt us. We actually need to be on our knees interceding for their healing, for their return to God. And that's what God's uh, looking for us. And meekness extends to the moment of death. See, Jesus was on the cross, and he... At the very end, what did he say? Forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. So if we are meek, we will hold on. We will hold on to the last breath and hope that somebody who is away from God can come back. And that is true grace. You see, had no resentment till the end. And then we know that Adam and Eve, what did they do as soon as they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? They started condemning each other. There was no meekness there. On the other hand, Jesus on the cross kept his mouth shut and there was grace and he brought us back to life. So that's what's going on. Now, third commandment tells us, do not take the name of the Lord in vain. And basically what's happening here is that uh, the author mentions this very well, that grace is something is deserving for people who actually uh, do not deserve it at that time. So when we read and when we talk about God, what we need to do is we need to not pray for their uh, 
uh, we need to pray for their um, salvation so that we don't utter any words in vain. Meekness seeks the very best of someone till the end. We know that Jesus did that for us. See, grace is needed most when people deserve it the least. We must learn to offer grace to the least deserving. Jesus trains us so we offer grace to our enemies through crucible. Act of mercy without meekness are not the same mercy and grace that Christ showed on the cross. If we are sinful, if we are not meek, even though we may want to offer grace, that is not true grace. When we disobey Christ, we are stand apart from him, and we are not able to show true grace. You see, without grace, the body of Christ falls apart. Without meekness, the body of Christ does not stand together. The foundation of heaven, the foundation of heaven is meekness, and the the people in heaven will continually show each other grace just like Jesus did. Adam and Eve, who are supposed to be the prince and princesses of meekness, showing grace to one another, now gave their authority to Satan, who is the prince of pride. You see, the best antidote against Satan and his angels is meekness. So, you know that Exodus 34, 7, it says, uh, it describes the God's characteristics, or Jesus. It says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love, and faithfulness, keeping mercy for thousands. You see, when we go to heaven and we're children of God, we will have, we will be described like this. For example, Danielle here. I can substitute her name and say, Danielle, one of the sisters of Jesus and one of the daughters of God, who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Wouldn't that be amazing? Just think about it. If we can attain that, that is the united kingdom of God where meekness is the foundation and grace is what we will be doing all the time. And that is what Jesus showed us. I have a lot of material, but, you know, um, the bottom line here is that we are in this classroom. We are in this classroom in this world, and we lost our meekness through Adam and Eve. But whatever we do, Jesus is going to draw us to him through the Holy Spirit. And Mrs. Elaine White says that we n are not subject to feelings and emotions, and we do not allow our feelings and emotions to fluctuate. Because why? Because Jesus is meek. Why? Because he never held a resentment towards us, because his love is unmistakable no matter what we do. And that is why his grace is real. So friends, grace, interceding for grace, only Jesus can do it, and he wants us to do it. We have difficulty doing it. But again, remember how Moses did it through relationship with God, relationship with Jesus. Let's do that. Thank you. I know that's, that that relationship is so important. And spending those times on our knees, so important. Yeah. Um, if we look at Daniel, he's, you, you never see Daniel criticized for sin. No in his life and he prayed three times a day mm -hmm. faithfully so much so it, it ended him in the lion's den and speaking of being hurt <laughs> this day is loving those who hurt us now this is a difficult this is this is difficult for most of us as humans and I can t I can say that um, this loving and I've tried, to, I've tried to look at this as like, I can love someone, I may not like what they're doing, mm -hmm. but I can still love them for <clears throat> the creation that they are in God. <clears throat> so God does not love us because we are by nature lovable, but we became lovable because he loves us. So it's, 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 it's really an interesting uh, it's really an interesting and difficult topic. Let's jump in and read Matthew 5, 43 through 48. Jesus calls us to love and pray for our enemies. Um, so verse 43 says, You have heard that it said to you, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who despitefully use you 
that they may <clears throat> be the, son, the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain to the just and the unjust. And we see that every day. <clears throat> God gives gifts to both the good and the evil people in this world. And so, um, so Jesus uses the example of his Father in heaven to illustrate how we should treat it those who that hurt us, who put us in the worst kind of crucibles. Jesus says that his father sends the blessing to both. And so he gives rain to the just and the unjust. And um, that doesn't mean we have to have warm and fuzzy feelings to them. For them, that doesn't mean that we stay in a, in a situation where being, we're being physically hurt. But it means that we don't give up on them. Sometimes when you do good things for your enemies, it heaps coals on their head, according to the Bible. So fundamentally, loving our enemies is not to be a feeling uh, we have for them, but specific actions toward them that care and consideration. So let's take a look here at, uh, first of all, um, my, the, the next um, verse that I have up here. For you love those who love you. What rewards do you have? Do not even the t tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus concludes this passage with a verse that um, often causes a lot of debate, and that's Matthew 5.48. But um, where he says, be perfect. Um, that's hard to do. But the meaning is, is very clear in its context. Those people who want to be perfect as God is perfect must show love to their enemies as God shows love to his. To be perfect in God's sight is to love the opposition, and do this, to do this takes meekness of heart that only God can give. So when you're struggling with one of your enemies, pray that God will give you his meekness of heart. If I, I want to look at a couple of examples of, of meekness. One is, is Stephen. Remember, Stephen was stoned. And he, before he died, made an extraordinary statement. So let's take a look at... Um, at that statement. Now remember, Stephen infuriated the crowd by speaking of Jesus. And the person who was there who led the stoning was who? Saul of Tarsus, right? And Saul later became Paul. And um, so we know that he was part of the reason Stephen was killed. So here, here we go. Acts 7, 54 through 60. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed their teeth with him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Wouldn't that be a beautiful way to go, to be able to see Christ in heaven? And said, look, see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and rat, ran at him with one accord. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of the young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, didn't Christ say the same thing on the cross? Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. So this is truly uh, loving your enemy. And we see that Stephen was very clear of mind when all of this took place. And fear didn't overwhelm him, but he was strong in the Holy Spirit and in God. So I want to take another a look at a, a different situation where we love our enemies 
And that is another, it involves another Saul, but Saul and King David. Because in this situation, there were many years that David struggled because of Saul. We see in 2 Samuel um, uh, 1, 11 through 18, Therefore David took hold of his own clothes and tore them, so did one and all who were with him. And they mourned and wept over... Huh? Yeah, and they mourned and wept over Saul for Jonathan his son, for the people of the Lord of the house of Israel, because he had fallen on the sword. Then the young man who came to him, I want to back up for just a second. What we see here is that, is that um, before this, Saul had come to David in the very beginning, and Saul had a problem with, with, his, um, with his spirit. And so David would come and play for him. And David, Saul threw actually the first, the first problem that Saul had with David, he took a javelin and threw it at him and tried to kill him. And from that point on, over the years, 10 different times. Now, David was about, he was younger than 20 when he was anointed by Samuel. And when he was um, on the throne, he was, he was 30, he, was, he went on the throne at 30 years of age. So probably close to 10 years, Saul tried to have him killed. 10 times Saul had put out for him to die. And David had a chance to kill Saul at one point and didn't. And so now as we finish this, this young man comes to, to David and he says, where are you from? And he answered, I'm the son of an alien Amalekite. So David said to him, how is it you are not afraid to put forth your hand and destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called on the young man and said, go near and execute him. And he struck him so that he died. So then David said to him, your blood is on your own head and your own mouth has testified against you saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Then David lamented with his lamentation and Saul and over Jonathan, his son. And he told them to teach the children the song of Judah. So even though, even though Saul had run for years, or David had run for years from Saul, he was still able to love him and he mourned his, mourned his death. It's, sometimes it's harder to be hurt over and over and over for a long period of time and still love someone. That, that's wearing. But Christ is our prime example. And so we need to look to Christ, even though as he died on the cross, <clears throat> it was for us and each one of our sins, he still loved those who hurt him. Dan Danielle. Stay. Yeah. A closed mouth. Uh, that's a difficult title too. <laughs> but let's, uh, what the lesson is referring to on Wednesday is a text that we will review in a bit, bit of detail in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse, starting with verses 18 through 20. So it's some advice of what, how a slave should behave towards their master. So let's read it together and then unpack it. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good one, the good and gentle, but also to the harsh, for this is commendable. If because of conscience to our God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. So that's sort of similar along the line of uh, uh, loving your enemies. It's like uh, uh, even if you have a harsh master, you're, you're a slave master, you are still to be patient and obedient because that's what's required of you. That's a difficult statement, just as difficult as loving your enemies. In our societies, we are, stand, we are taught to stand for, the, for injustice, for justice and against injustice, uh, against unfair treatment of others. I mean, even the, the Bible tells us to do so on behalf of others, but it seems that Meekness is referring when you are not standing up for your own 
rights and for your own injustice, like when you're being t treated injustice, but you trust the situation to the Father. It kind of takes Romans 8.28 literally. That, and what does Romans 8.28 say? It says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. So in other words, if your master is treating you unfairly, you are still to believe in the Romans 8.28 that all things work together for good. Now, um, Luke 12.7 says, But the very hours of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So in other words, not only are you to trust the Lord in the Romans 8.28 fashion, but you also are to trust the Lord that he really takes care of every single detail of your life. Because we've heard sometimes Christians say that the Lord uh, is present in the big decisions of your life, but not in the little things. This Luke 12.7 says, he even has counted the hairs on my head. So he, and, he, and I'm of more th worth than many little sparrows. So the idea is that he is present and in control of every little detail of my life, the small and the large. Now, who do, who do we know in the Bible that are great examples of being mistreated uh, as servants and slaves and still being that example that the Lord is pointing us to be? Joseph. I mean, he went from beloved son, doted on, encouraged by God that life would serve a great purpose. I mean, remember the dreams that he had when he was young and still doted on in his father's home. He had the dreams that God gave him that his brothers and even his parents would bow down to him. So that was the preparation that he had in his mind. But what follows are two decades of crucibles, sold in as a slave uh, in slavery, and how did he behave as a slave? We already know exactly as the verse that we've studied encouraged. He was submissive to his master Potiphar. Uh, he was good and gentle. He endured grief, suffered wrongfully. He was sent to prison. He still continues to be unchanged through that entire two decades of crucibles. Uh, uh, good, gentle, and suffered wrongfully until the appointed time when God had given him all of a sudden the position of vizier in Egypt or the second in command. Uh, and he's second only to Pharaoh. Uh, but the test, the true test came when his brothers came in front of him and he could have made them pay. Instead, he acknowledged God's total supremacy in his life and those famous words of his. Uh, in Genesis 45, verses 4 through 8, let's review quickly. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with our, yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. And that is the key to our text. God sent me before you to preserve life. I mean, if I were in his position, I think I would have a few more words, choice words from my brothers. But he's not. He immediately takes this from attention to them or him and turns it to God. For those two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Indeed, the incredible meekness of Joseph, God could create because Joseph trusted and believed that God would still be in control of his life through the entire crucible. That is the case with all of us. That's the only way this meekness develops when we have complete and total surrender and trust into the Lord's hand, believing that at that very moment when we are going through the toughest, he is still there. And let's review the rest of our text that we have for today 
in continuing in verses 21 and 25 in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 and 25. For this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So not only do we have Joseph, we really have the best example. Who committed no sin, Jesus committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who judges? He committed himself to God who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness. He had a plan and a purpose, and that was God's plan and purpose that he was executing. By whose stripes you were healed? For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus did not stay on the cross out of fear, uh, constraint, or inability to escape. In his own words, Jesus said in Matthew 26:53. Or do you think that I cannot pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? He lovingly and voluntarily gave his life for our salvation. In summary, to Wednesday, meekness does not try to defend itself under injustice, but trusts the situation to the father. As long as I believe and trust the Lord, when he assures me that he is present and in control of my life, circumstances, even in the crucible, and that all things work together for good in my life, for I love God and I'm called according to his purpose, then meekness will take root in me without me even realizing it. And God will blossom it into a beautiful, visible flower that will speak to a suffering world around me of God's incredible love. It will just beam out with incredible power. My only part is to trust the Lord at all times, no matter what. All right, <clears throat> David. Thank you, Barbara. This is a Thursday's lesson, A Rock and Refuge. So, so far on Sunday, we learned that <coughs> meekness is expressed in voluntary submission to be broken bread and grape, uh -huh. uh, to bear um, fruit. Then on Monday, we learned that to intercede for grace for the ones who do not deserve grace is the characteristics of meekness. And then a Tuesday, keep our mouth closed and allow Holy Spirit to speak. That's on um, uh, Wednesday. And then the Thursday is trusting, first slide, trusting God as he who is sovereign over all things is also a trait of, um, of meekness. So the, the topic of Thursday is God is our rock and our refuge. And Daniel, um, thank you for reading that, Matthew chapter 10. God is in control of everything, even the hairs on our head. So, you know, the problem is that we as human beings, since we have the knowledge of good and evil, we always think that we should control something. And sometimes we feel like, oh, God controls the bigger things and we control the little things. The problem is all sins start with little things and then it becomes big things. So, uh, Job, the next slide, uh, to, uh, Job says, uh, Job 12.10 says, In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. And uh, so the question is, do we have enough meekness to trust God as our rock and our refuge? You see Proverbs, the next slide, uh, 19.21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. So God is always in control of all things, and his purpose will be established in his creation. So Israelites, oftentimes, when um, they went through trouble, they said, oh, God, you're not, where are you? You're not hearing us. So the next slide, it says in Isaiah 40. 27 to 31. For time's sake, I'm just going to read. When Israelites saying, uh, God is telling Israelites, why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? And then God says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. You see, meekness in us will be established when we have that relationship, when we completely realize that we are not in control of our lives, but God is, and we need to have that submission. Meekness gives us 
um, a, a good, clear connection with heaven because heaven's foundation is meekness. So through meekness, we bring Christ and his salvation into the world. Next slide. The difficulties we have to encounter, the diff you know, the diff different encounters that we have, the difficulties we have in this life may be lessened by the fact that if we realize how Christ did everything on the cross, that his meekness should bring us some peace. And Mrs. Ellen White says, if we possess the humility of our master, we shall rise above the slights, the rebuffs, the annoyances to which we are daily exposed, and they will cease to cast a gloom over our spirit. Psalms 62, in the Sabbath school lesson, the author mentions uh, Psalm uh, 62. I will read verse 5, 7, and part of 8. It says, My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. So verse 7, In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge, is, is in God. Trust in Him at all times, you people. You see, David, David learned to trust in God. He had so many talents, but he realized without God, without true meekness, true surrender, without making God as the rock and the refuge, there is no salvation. See, without meekness, there is no salvation for us. We will be dust again. And in Isaiah, next slide, 40, 31 says, but those who wait on the Lord, see, waiting in the Lord, Barbara, Daniel, is difficult because we want to do it. We want to control our destiny. Even little ones we want to control. But really, God is our refuge and rock. And that is important. And that is part of meekness. You see, in, in, um, in the fruit of the Spirit, the last one is self-control. So everything that we see that we do in this world, our tendency is to take control. But meekness will allow us to have God take control. He will be our rock and the refuge. Um, Psalms 139 is a psalm of praise. And I, I recommend all of us to read this once a week before the Sabbath starts. It's about give thanks to the Lord for his good, for his mercy endures forever. And you have these verses keep going and going. So reading this, praising God will make us realize that God is the only one where we can find a rock and refuge. You see, um, people who do not know Jesus, uh, who truly know, not know Jesus in church later on will try to seek their own uh, selfish desire. And people that are meek, people who will be meek, will be labeled as uh, people that are weak, fanatics. And, and at that time, there will be a battle, in, even within our church, within the church members. And we see in that time of trouble, the true meekness of the people, their true dependence on Christ as the rock and the refuge will be very important for us to stay the path. And that is really important. See, meekness is the rock and the refuge that keeps us connected to God as we acknowledge our need for God in every large and small parts of our life. Um, it, um, in Psalms 62, 5, uh, David says, My soul wait thou only upon God for my expectation is from him. The Sabbath school um, author asked a few questions. He says, how does humility allow us to rise above all the hurts and annoyances? And the answer from the Sabbath school uh, week, I would say, for this Thursday, God is in control. And that is why we can stop complaining, that we can rise above our hurt and pain. Because God is just and he will do the right thing. Do you believe that? If we cannot believe it, we need to spend more time in studying, praying, fasting, and rejoicing God. The next question, the author says, In your own particular culture, how are the characteristics of humility and meekness viewed? Daniel, Barbara both mentioned that meekness, humility is a sign of weakness, right? So in cultures where meekness and humility is seen as weakness, we must pray, read, praise, and fast to allow the Holy Spirit to fully submit to God. We must encourage one another as Jesus told us to do. Church has a big part in it. And then the third question he asks, 
Are there any great examples of meekness and humility among people today who are alive? And I would say Mother Teresa. She devoted her life serving the people with leprosy and with TB. Uh, TB and she did not seek glory. A good example for me is Mother Teresa. You may have other examples. The last question is, why is it that we so uh, often equate meekness and humility, humility with weakness and the answer is very simple we mentioned earlier because we as uh, don't want to surrender our control to god and because of that we want to uh, we feel like when we have to surrender to god we are not strong we are weak i want to end really quick with this poem by mother teresa anyway it's uh, i just read for the last uh, few uh, you know uh, verses if you find serenity and happiness they may be jealous be happy anyway the good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Do the, give the world the best you've got anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it is between you and your God. It was never between you and them anyway. She was saying that she is doing everything because she knows it's always God who is in control. And that's the Thursday's lesson. Thank you. Okay. Danielle, you had some final thoughts. Yes, a brief final thought. Uh, this lesson was very powerful for me because meekness has been sort of this elusive thing that I never quite fully understood. Um, but what came clear to me through this lesson is that God allows us a crucible and uses it to fashion us into his image. And his image was that of meekness, where patient suffering and endurance on our behalf without complaint. And we cannot copy or imitate his image. It's instead, we can only keep our eyes on him. And as we keep our eyes on him, no matter what we go through, and trust and believe every one of his assurances that we have in the Bible, in his word, then he, that he is ever present and in control of our lives, then in both in the good times and in the bad times, that he's still in control and he is still directing the details of our life, then we can have that trusted assurance and become that image of meekness. It doesn't come from us. And one such text is Matthew 28, 20. says to the disciples, and teaching them, like they're supposed to go out and teach the believers, us. Teaching them to obey every time, everything that I've commanded you. And surely, I'm with you always to the end of age. So. Thank you. This, this, <clears throat> um, this issue of meekness is, is a hard one for those of us who are not meek to get our head around. But <clears throat> I want to read something from Desire of Ages in, in, in closing. The difficulties we have to encounter may, may be very much lessened by that meekness which hides itself in Christ. If we possess the humility of our master, we shall rise above the slights, the rebuffs, the annoyances <clears throat> to which we are daily exposed, and they will cease to cast a gloom over the spirit. The highest evidence of nobility in a, Christi in a Christian is self-control. He who under the abuse or cruelty fails to maintain a calm and trustful spirit robs God of the right to reveal in him his own perfection of character. Lowly is the heart, is the strength that gives victory to the followers of Christ. It is the token of their connection with the courts above. <clears throat> I looked at, um, I've been studying um, with some, some folks the, the book of Daniel, and I realized, and it, it, it really has settled with me, if you read the story of Daniel, if you thrill the, the stories of the three worthies and the fiery furnace, the only thing they cared about was reflecting God. They didn't care what happened to themselves. It was only being able to reflect God in their character. So one of the things <clears throat> that they would ask each other and themselves is, this decision I'm making, this choice I'm making, this reaction that I'm having to this situation, is it, is it about me or is it about God? And so that is what I believe <clears throat> this lesson is about, 
is truly reflecting God in our characters. Even if the God doesn't save us, we will not worship you. Yep. Yep. Even if we die. Yeah. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for this wonderful lesson on meekness. We pray, Lord, that your spirit, your Holy Spirit, will come into each one of our hearts in such a way that your character will shine forth. That when we our, our feelings are hurt, we're attacked, and, and whatever happens in our life, <clears throat> that we realize it's not about us, but it's about you. And so we pray, Lord, that we really grasp that concept within our minds and within our hearts. We pray now as we go through the rest of the Sabbath day that it will be a high Sabbath, it will be a blessing, and that we'll be able to rejoice in this time with you. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Thank you.